I'm going to be moderating this panel. Um, I think we could just start out with a round of introductions from the end end. The, the question is, can you introduce yourself, maybe say a few words about your project? Uh, um, sort of the topic of this panel is sort of the modules and subcomponents of blockchains. And so we're just going to talk about innovation that's happening at sort of various layers of the system, uh, consensus, smart contracts, etc. Okay, so uh, once again, I'm Marian Kutmarski and I work in a decent company. I work as a blockchain engineer, so uh, the main topic of my work is to uh, work on more develop the scalability, uh, solve the issues of scalability, and then mostly the consensus. Uh, also, the networking problems related to peer to peer. Uh, my name is Arthur Falls. I'm the Director of Communications at Definity. Uh, Definity is a uh, ultra-fast, scalable uh, blockchain network that <coughs> aims to be as efficient, uh, inexpensive, and uh, nearly as performant as Amazon Web Services uh, type hosting. Hey guys, uh, my name is Sunny Agarwal. Uh, I, I spoke earlier this morning, and so I work on uh, the Tendermint and Cosmos projects, and uh, like I mentioned in the morning, and Harriet from Irish Network also mentioned, uh, our goal is to build an ecosystem of application-specific blockchains. And so we're building the tools to allow uh, an ecosystem, an internet of blockchains to uh, communicate with each other, and building the tooling that allows developers to build their own uh, blockchains. Hello. My name is Cho Won Bin, and I'm the developer of Quantum. Quantum is a project that it is a multi virtual machine compatible that smart contract platform. And we are, we are supporting EVM based on Bitcoin's UTX model. And in the future, we will support more virtual machines like the x86 virtual machine we are working on. And we also is the first uh, working smart contract platform uh, using QS. Consensus mechanism. Thank you. I'm the Chinese founder of Ontology. Ontology is a multiple chip public projectors and also a trust collaboration platform. The major object for the Ontology is to build a bridge to link the real business scenario. Let the business service on blockchain also can be supported by the off chain scenarios and the real business case environment. Thank you, everyone. Um, so where I think we could probably start off is sort of what I'd like you to do is let's we'll, we'll, we'll go through a number of different topics, but maybe you could talk about how much of uh, sort of innovation in this space, in, in this sort of area, this sort of module of a blockchain um, is a priority for your project and what you think the sort of trade-offs are, are around them. So maybe we can talk, start with the consensus. Um, how the how the blockchain comes to agreement? Is... Sure, I think um, I I'd really like to, to throw a, a few cents in, in that court. Um, so consensus is a really interesting uh, field. Obviously, um, you know Leslie Lamport's um, paper describing the uh, practical visiting fault tolerance was back in or visiting fault tolerance. Sorry, was back in um, the early eighties and. Um, you know, we've been iterating on this work for ever since. It only really became popular in, uh, with the advent of Bitcoin in 2009. And, I mean, ever since then, we've been trying to find faster ways for large networks to come to agreement. And when we think about consensus, usually we mean around a, uh, a uh, verifiable data store, like a, uh, you know, often referred to as a ledger, like a blockchain. Um, but... How we go about doing that involves multiple different um, mechanisms. So, you know, we have to have some kind of civil resistance. This might mean commissioning. This might mean a, uh, a uh, cryptographic puzzle like an uh, Nakamoto consensus. This might be um, gated by the holding of cryptographic tokens. Then you've also got um, uh, penalization of misbehavior in the network. And uh, somehow we also, usually that we need to include some... Uh, some kind of source of randomness in order to select um, 
participants can perform certain roles in a way that's not predictable or manipulable. Um, in the case of Definity, um, you know, we can generalize across a whole bunch of different examples. In the case of Definity, we have a verifiable random function. I know Ethereum, which has always used a system referred to as commit reveal. Um, and uh, in all of these different um, mechanisms of generating randomness um, and, uh, and implementing civil resistance, they all interact in quite, ex in quite interesting and, and complex uh, ways. So I think consensus itself is a phenomenally interesting and sprawling subject. So I think one of the more interesting questions that probably need to get to the audience is, what does having a new consensus mechanism do over sort of the dominant consensus mechanism work? What does it let your blockchain do that, that, other, that, that the existing blockchains can? So, uh, you know, I think one of the main things that you know, a lot of work has been being put into a lot of state-based uh, consensus uh, algorithms lately, and I think this, this comes from a lot of different uh, places. Uh, one of the biggest obvious ones is uh, concerns around scalability, and, you know, usually uh, proof-of-stake consensus algorithms, especially when you're using proof-of-stake DFT algorithms, uh, as opposed to Nakamoto consensus, uh, you, it does give you uh, massive scalability benefits and like environmental uh, efficiencies. But one of the other things that proof of stake also gives you is this nice uh, property where your chain security is sort of isolated to that chain alone. So if you do want to imagine a world in which there are many, many blockchains, which like I mentioned, Cosmos is aiming for, um, if these all these chains are proof of work blockchains. This would it's very easy for uh, miners to shift their hash power quickly across different chains and try to like, and this makes the security very low. I'm sure many people have looked, seen that website, uh, Crypto51.app. It shows like how much it costs to 51 percent attack some uh, certain blockchains, and like there are some very very high value blockchains that can be attack for a cost of a couple of thousand dollars. And it's, you know, it's kind of crazy. Um, what proof of stake does is, the nice thing is, I can't use my staking token on chain A to somehow attack chain B. Uh, and so that's one very nice property that often goes undersighted with uh, a lot of these new consensus engines. Anyone else have any thoughts? I will just add uh, that what has been said is true. The thing is about uh, DPoS that uh, it needs some kind of uh, maintenance or uh, governance because it's social based. So uh, you need to convince the participants to vote in order to secure the network as well. So it's like a little bit of the flaws or the cons of the system. Uh, in comparison to proof of work, when everything works automatically, you just join the network, but you are participating in uh, like huge uh, polls, uh, and now uh, the, the pooling is uh, very dangerous uh, by itself because uh, you can form the pool that can perform 51% attack. Now, just the gentleman agreement that they are not going to do that. Uh, so, a lot of things run behind uh, in the consensus mechanism. Go waiting for uh, new research. Uh, right now, I think the promising uh, thing is to combine the proof of work for delegating candidates in EPOS. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the work that was done on very earlier proof of stake consensus engines uh, did have like these sort of drawbacks you mentioned. Uh, you know, like things that are being used in like bit shares in the US. But I think. Usually, if you look at most of the modern uh, proof of stake consensus, such as Tendermint or Casper or like uh, Divinity Special Relay, like I think um, a lot of these like economic issues have relatively been uh, heavily developed. Uh, I don't know, maybe Kirtan, maybe you guys, Quantum, you guys can like, talk a little bit about how you guys have been thinking about proof of stake. Long time is using proof of stake consensus rule. And we think uh, the first idea we even change the proof of work to proof of stake is because of electricity. The electricity using the proof of work is, is very high and much higher than some small countries. So we change it to proof of stake. And we think there should be a trade-off between the 
decentralization and security. We think proof of stake is a, a better balance than proof of work because there are many big miners right now in the, in the world and it is more centralized than the Satoshi thought about the big, the big point or the blockchain should be. So I think uh, for content, we have more than 7,000 uh, full nodes in, in the world and it is, it is in the third place of um, less than Bitcoin and less than zero. I think it is in the third place that, uh, that we have more than 7,000 nodes. And these four nodes uh, means e equality and freedom to everyone. Everyone can join the network. Everyone is free to, to leave the network. And everyone knows everything about the network. I think POS is totally different from uh, DFOS because the DFOS is more centralized and we think the most important thing in the blockchain world should be decentralization so we choose proof of stake and do not use the proof of work and all proof of some delicate solutions so that's why we choose proof of stake yeah, I think this is uh because this also is from the planets between the performance and decentralized levels. And for the basic algorithm, the next phase, the consensus model is more like a, a process, a mechanism, other than the algorithm. Uh, because maybe we are integrating different kind of features, for example, the reputation, or this kind of offline or online governance integration, this kind of parts. Um, for our training right now, apologies, that's when we call the BFT. We, use, we need the BFT to confirm the actual affinity uh, very quickly. This is Kissings. And we also found a kind of balance between the decentralized level and the uh, performance between that. So maybe POS is a kind of quick way, but we need to find some balance between the decentralized level. Did term BFT was mentioned twice? Who wants to explain? That means. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, BFT stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Um, and I think in the context that most people are saying here, we actually meant classical BFT. And so classical BFT is the uh, traditional consensus style that has been being developed since the 80s, uh, in where you have a set of known participants uh, kind of coming to consensus on some data uh, or some value. And you know, most uh, classical BFT algorithms have usually followed this process of everyone comes together and like comes to consensus on value one, and then when everyone comes to consensus on this, then we go up, then everyone starts to come to consensus on the next value. Well what Nakamoto consensus sort of did was it allowed it, it kind of flipped that on its head and said instead of like you know, making sure everyone agrees on the value right now before we move on. Let's like, you know, kind of have this emergent consensus thing happen where, um, you know, I will, one miner will propose one block and then another miner will propose another block and another miner will propose another block. Um, and then over time, the longest chain, uh, you slowly figure out what's been finalized. Um, and I think what's interesting is that for the longest time, classical BFT algorithms are kind of ignored uh, for a long period of time because it wasn't really sure how to make them uh, permissionless. And so proof of work uh, came up as this idea with Nakamoto consensus and kind of those two popped up in 2009 together. And what Bitcoin did was it made people realize that, oh, a decentralized currency can have value in and of itself just for having the property that it is decentralized. And then, once you realize this, a couple of people in like early, uh, like 2013 to 2014, like primarily like the three I know are Jay Kwan, Vitalik Buterin, and Dominic Williams, sort of all came up with this idea of like, oh look, we can actually create this like self-reinforcing cycle, and we can actually use proof of stake to make BFT, classical BFT, work in a permissionless setting. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I'd say actually there's something else to add to this, and that is that the, the importance of high performance um, Byzantine fault tolerance. So when we talk about these blockchain networks, and we're focusing kind of 
considering that the blockchain was invented 10 years ago and we've been, and it hasn't really evolved, um, we've, we're, we seem to be a bit excessively focused on this term, I believe, um, because there's so much other stuff that's been developed. But in order to communicate across a network, um, this, uh, or a, a blockchain-based network, um, the time it takes to communicate across that network is a multiple of the time it takes to finalize a, a change in state or an action that's taking place on that network. So if it takes a long time to finalize something um, through your, your um, Byzantine fault tolerance um, algorithm, right, um, you find yourself waiting you know, many times as long in order to make to communicate across that network. And, at the moment, um, there really isn't a solution that goes but that is below the frustration threshold um, for any of these systems. So, you know, work in this area is um, as sorely needed. I mean, it's it's a really critical area of research and uh, and the entire field that we're that we're here to kind of examine today. Okay, uh, I think let's move on. Um, I'd say the next sort of key area where you're seeing a lot of innovation across a number of different projects uh, is sort of the, the sort of execution environment of, of, of programs or logic, uh, the sort of smart contract layer. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of innovations at the smart contract layer for your projects and sort of why, where you think this will make a big difference in terms of adoption. I think the overall sort of uh, thrust of the consensus layer if you, you were to extract to a very high level, it's everybody is looking for throughput and performance. Everybody looks at blockchains today and says, okay, it takes far too long for them to come to consensus, and it takes, and they can come to consensus on far too few transactions. Uh, so then sort of, so these, the consensus innovations that all of these projects are working on are about resolving that problem. What, what problem is the smart contract sort of in, in execution layer innovation supposed to solve, and, uh, and, and what are, what, what is the approach that your project is taking? Um, yes, for ours, uh, the strategy is still build our own uh, virtual machine for smart contracts. The reason is like the other smart contract solution, and why is you can use like a Docker to use the environment, open environment to go on the smart contract directly. Uh, but it's dangerous, dangerous environment. You can under control many things, the data or all those kind of things, you easily find some risk. So the owner virtual machine is important. You can control the progress and control the logic. Uh, that's the case. It's also, you can have a lot of high performance uh, enhancement for that. And but for the high level, we actually uh, private a lot of the compiler to do the to support different language. Not only one kind of language can use it. You also can use uh, C sharp, Java, or JavaScript, Python, Go. Different language you are familiar with to build your smart contract directly. So I think this way can be integrated to private and more security and with high performance. Also, it's more convenient for the uh, programmer. They can easily do the programming. Those kind of things. Of course, another is uh, Watson. But Watson have not been proved in blockchain infrastructure right now. We don't know what kind of risk will happen. So we, will, we already have finished our Watson solution as well. But we're not open yet. We want to uh, check more long time. Which kind of risk in uh, Russia? We have a similar opinion on this. And as I mentioned, Quantum is working on our own virtual machine called X86 virtual machine. It can support X86 ISA, which is a more mature ISA than any other ISA, I think. And by supporting this, we can support more mainstream language like Mention, C++, Rust. And we also su can support all kinds of mature tool chains like a better debugger, a better combiner, for free. We can do nothing and just support x86 ISA. So that's why we, why we choose x86 as our ISA. And also, and content can support multiple virtual machines, not only for VM, not only for x86 virtual machines. And we just mentioned about WSM. We're also working on this, and hopefully, in the future, we don't know which which machine will will, will win in the last. But we we are ready for different kind of machine. We think uh, we think currently the, at the slow mid 
no Mr. Tim mentioned most of the on-chain attack is because of the bug in solidity in the smart contract. So we think we need a more mature, mature programming language to, to create a more secure, secure smart contract in the future. Um, yeah, so for Cosmos, we're actually taking a slightly different approach to uh, blockchain applications. Uh, we're actually decided not to focus on smart contract VMs right now. And instead, we are focusing on the concept of using like application-specific blockchains. Uh, and that, and you know, the idea is you only need one application on that blockchain. And the reason a lot of the time you need a blockchain VM is that you need to manage the interactions between different applications on the blockchain, or you need to force, you know. In a Turing complete VM blockchain, you have arbitrary developers from anywhere uploading code to your blockchain. You don't know that it's, you need a way to ensure that that code being uploaded is perfectly deterministic or it, uh, it doesn't, it, it halts at some point, which is why you need the whole gas counting mechanism. And, you know, all of, all of these things, like running in a VM causes you to be, you know, classical compiled versus interpreted code compiled is always faster. Uh, you know, having to gas count every single individual operation at massive overhead. Uh, but instead, if you had your code, uh, you wanted to make your application, let's say you wanted to, you knew you wanted to make a DEX, you could go ahead and build the DEX logic as part of the core native code base of your app blockchain, and you compile it, and then it runs. You don't, it doesn't, you don't need a way to allow arbitrary developers to add code to your blockchain. And that's not to say that we're not supporting VMs. We also have a project called Ethermint, which is where we're taking the EVM and adding it as a module into the Cosmos SDK. So that way you can have your native modules living alongside uh, EVM smart contracts. Because there are times where you do want smart contracts. And we're starting with the EVM just because it's the most mature uh, or until very recently, it was the only like finished uh, blockchain VM. Uh, now that like Tezos has been released and stuff, and as more VMs come, it will be very interesting to see how different VMs can act, uh, interact on the same blockchain or over different blockchains over uh, inter-blockchain communication. So that's uh, you make a really interesting point, uh, Sunny, about the um, the value of kind of uh, application specific blockchains. And this kind of comes down to um, uh, kind of a, a, just a personal opinion of mine, and that is that um, blockchains themselves are best thought of as hardware, not as protocols. Um, and really what we're, what we're um, running when we run these uh, blockchains is essentially a virtual machine of some sort, even if it has a limited, uh, limited set of possible operations. Um, and um, and this, is, this can be kind of thought of as a CPU. And of course, we know that there is tremendous value in general purpose computing. And uh, you know, we've, we've seen this, and the, um, you know, that, that's why we don't use ASICs for everything. You know? And um, I think that you know, one thing that uh, Divinity has aimed to do is find what is the most common, the most broadly accepted virtual machine in the world. And I heard, uh, I heard uh, one of you guys mention that it wasn't yet. Um, so Google, Apple, Microsoft, and the Mozilla Foundation um, got together and said recently and said, um, I think it was 2014 was when they started discussing this, were everyone sick to death of having to compile to JavaScript to um, kind of run stuff or to, to write um, programs in JavaScript to run on the web. Let's come up with a system to allow us to write in any language we want. And um, what they wound up producing was a very thin abstraction of common uh, CPU instructions um, that were present in both mobile and desktop hardware and, and PC hardware, and then um, and then basically they they built a virtual machine that they included in all of their browsers that can run that bytecode. And so now, if you want to write uh, write a computer program and uh, and have that run in any environment, then um, you can do that in a uh, in just about any language. And once the compilers have been built, which everyone is now currently working on, compile that into um, WebAssembly or WASM bytecode. And so 
Well, we're having this discussion about virtual machines. Um, the world is moving towards a virtual machine standard, and uh, it does appear that WebAssembly is going to be that standard. Which isn't to say that um, the x86 approach isn't uh, isn't like really wise, because at the end of the day, you're going to be running the code on x86 processes, which are present in PCs and uh, and in servers. Um, but there is this other kind of very democratic approach that's uh, that's happening um, and coming from the major browser vendors. I concur with Sunny and Arthur. Uh, I just saw uh, uh, that maybe the problem with the smart contracts or contracts is the insufficient isolation and uh, transparency of the blockchain that uh, everybody can attack everybody, uh, basically. Uh, so this kind of uh, containerization or visualization is on par. Uh, but still, uh, the point of view of the system uh, like when you run it uh, on smart contracts, you have to pay for uh, execution uh, or the time. But uh, if you deploy your own centralized application, you can fine tune your blockchain network. So you don't need to participate in uh, like most terms like Ethereum, for example, that you have to pay for infrastructure. So, uh, so it's a uh, different tools. Um, in terms of innovation on the smart contract layer and programming, uh, in order for sort of next generation innovation to take place? Uh, yeah, so I think definitely the object capabilities is a very important one. Uh, I think most of the biggest bugs that we've seen in the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, I think both of the major parity bugs, as well as think about it a little bit, uh, the DAO was a failure of access control, and I think an object capabilities uh, approach is very interesting because the thing I like about object capabilities is it fails safely. If there's a bug in the object capabilities, it usually ends up being such that no one can access it, not rather than in the alternative access control method, which is called ACLs, access control list. The, this failure mode is anyone can access it, and that's sort of what happened in the parity bug situation. So I think that the object capability approach stuff that's been going on in, in uh, Dependencies Crimea, and we're also using a similar object capabilities approach in Cosmos SDK is really good. Um, another thing that I think uh, a lot of people should start being more aware of is uh, designing uh, con like whether you're doing smart contracts or modules or Designing applications to be modular and be able to interoperate in an asynchronous fashion. So as we move more towards an interchain world, whether that's you know Cosmos zones or whether it's sharding or whether it's plasma, uh, more and more stuff is. Or even if you're using other scalability event systems like Truebit, for example, right? All of these systems usually rely on some level of asynchrony, and the EVM has sort of spoiled us all in a little bit where. It kind of promised us everything being synchronous and atomic, but we realize now that, oh, that doesn't actually scale. We need to uh, be re-architecting our uh, mindset when it comes to pro uh, blockchain programming to take asynchrony in mind. Web you on paper. <laughs> so, uh, blockchains are peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, sort of peer-to-peer -peer networking technology has sort of seen sort of its maturity evolve uh, considerably with blockchains. Is there uh, is there a peer-to-peer -peer networking innovation that's sort of at the core of your product? Well, glad you ask. <laughs> yeah, so we've done tons and tons of work on uh, on the, the network layer of Definity, uh, and largely because you find, especially in um, say. Uh, traditional uh, Nakamoto consensus, it ignores completely the networking layer and it opens itself up to numerous uh, potential attacks um, by not uh, kind of enforcing that all participants in the network actually have something at stake. Um, and, uh, and this is kind of, this is a consequence of the, the openness of proof of work networks, which of course have their own benefits. But in Definity, we've, we've taken the view that we need to actually constrain or determine the exact set of nodes that any particular node can, has the ability to connect to. And uh, the reason for this is to prevent um, what are sometimes called, as, called eclipse attacks, 
where a, um, a large number of nodes are um, built, spun up in proximity of, uh, of one particular node in order to uh, sensor it. Um, also, the other big concern <coughs> is that you can have, as what's happened in, uh, in Bitcoin and, and now in Ethereum, the emergence of block relay networks. And this is where blocks are, a, a particular connection is set up between a payment processor and a miner, or between miners, in order to relay blocks directly between them. And that gives them a privileged position on the network. Um, also, I mean, I know we don't, we don't need to get too deep into that, but yeah, so the idea in, um, in Definity is that we determine the exact nodes that any particular node can connect to, and we change this regularly over time, so that you know, we don't have any kind of adverse, uh, adverse effects, that, or persistent adverse effects as a result of that. That's really cool. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things that kind of uh, is a major research focus of uh, the Kenderman team, uh, kind of like on the intersection between peer-to-peer -peer and uh, consensus, which we were talking about earlier. Um, Kenderman, we really designed uh, a BFD consensus engine uh, specifically for use in a gossip network. And so one of the innovations that we've been trying to uh, do a lot of research and development on is how can we use, is there any way we can use our gossip network to actually help improve the BFD consensus? Um, so, one of the cons, I guess I should have maybe mentioned when I talked about classical BFD versus Nakamoto consensus, is classical BFD has always required uh, some sort of N squared communication where every validator node has to communicate to every other validator node uh, and communicate their signatures. And this makes a lot of traffic on the uh, gossip network as there's like and, and so many uh, signatures being propagated. So one thing that we've been doing a lot of research on is something called BLS aggregation. And what this means is the let's say I'm a full node that's connected to two validators, right? And I've received both of their signatures. What BLS aggregation allows me to do is actually aggregate both of those signatures and create a single signature, and I can pass on this single signature to my peers. So instead of like sending over twice as much data, I can send over half as much data, and this will heavily reduce the uh, bandwidth the, the bandwidth load on the network and allow you to scale to far more validators or and or faster block times. How much longer do you want this to keep going? Um, well, why don't they tell me whether or not the numbers are supposed to end? Um, how about privacy? Uh, that's another layer of the system where we're seeing a lot of innovation. Uh, are, is there sort of any sort of core privacy innovations in, or that, you, that are of interest to you personally or interest to your project? That you Nothing in uh, Definity, but I'm really interested to hear about uh, some of the kind of experts on the panel talk about um, ZK Snarks. Um, or actually, just at least to differentiate ZK Snarks and Bulletproofs and uh, Starks as well. Okay, I guess I'll take that. <laughs> got one minute. Okay, one minute. Let's see. Uh, okay, Snarks, Bulletproof, Starks. Snarks are these beautiful, ma magical piece of mathematics that like allows me to prove any computation in a constant amount of time. And I can, with like select privacy features, where I can basically say that, like, look, I don't have to reveal everything, uh, all the inputs to my function. Um, Cosmos and Thunderman, we are not doing any research on it ourselves, but we uh, work a lot with a lot of professors, especially uh, Alessandro Chiesa at Berkeley, on like doing uh, R&D on development on Snarks. Bulletproofs are similar uh, functionality. What they do, what they give you is you don't have the trusted setup that you have with Snarks. So many of you may have heard like the crazy stories about the Zcash generation ceremony, like Peter Todd like hiding in like a cardboard box with aluminum or something. Um, so bulletproofs, you can they're not as efficient as Snarks, but you don't have this trust assumption. And then finally, Starks are like uh, even bigger than Bulletproofs, for now, Starks are uh, very new, as are Bulletproofs, as are Snarks, like, you know, Snarks are like, maybe like four or five years old, but like, that's some sort of old tech in the in that space already, somehow. Um, Starks allow you to get this level of quantum resistance. 
which uh, you know is a interesting idea. I'm not sure how relevant it is yet, but it might be a useful in the future. Well, thank you very much.